Today is Wednesday, January 27th. Uh, this is the 11 a.m. section. <clears throat> As I said, the uh, recording has started. Uh, what we're going to do today is complete <clears throat> lecture note one, uh, talk about homework one, which will be due on Monday, and uh, any issues relating to Bloomberg, uh, which is where I'll start. Um, as of yesterday, I had approximately 115 people fill out the Google form that should now have access to Bloomberg. Uh, if you haven't filled out the Google form yet, please do uh, at your earliest convenience so I can get you approved so you can complete the registration because you will need to use uh, the Bloomberg terminal in order to do homework one, which is due on Monday. So, and next week we're gonna be starting the Bloomberg trading challenge. So you will need the terminal as well as part of the trading challenge. So that's all coming up. <clears throat> so I wanna make sure everybody is aware of that. And I also have very good news, <clears throat> which is Bloomberg for the, ed the Bloomberg for Education team uh, has agreed to come and they're gonna be guest lecturing in our class on Monday, February 22nd. Uh, they will be here the entire day and they'll be here for all four sections. Uh, basically two things. One, that team uh, is responsible for recruiting here at Smith. So they talk to, to you about the opportunities for both full-time employment as well as internships. And these are the people that are running those interviews. Uh, <clears throat> what's interesting is Bloomberg, we weren't even on their radar a, a decade ago. And now we're actually one of their feeder schools uh, for hiring Smith grads. And a lot of people that have actually been in this class are now working at Bloomberg. Um, so it's a good opportunity for those of you that are, are looking for internships or jobs. And these are the people that uh, you need to talk to. So they're gonna be here all day. Uh, what they're also gonna be here is to give us advanced training on the terminal. Uh, so that is gonna be on Monday, February 22nd, all day. So very excited that they're willing to come back and continue to support our class associated with the Bloomberg terminal. Um, I also heard that some people were having trouble with the class code. Uh, so two things, one, the class code is case sensitive, but number two, uh, if you're putting in the class code to get the Bloomberg certification, to be honest with you, you don't really need it. Uh, you can get certified without the class code uh, because your proof of certification to me is gonna be a screenshot showing that the four modules had more than 70%. So whether or not you have a class code to some degree is irrelevant and incidental to the screenshot. It's nice to have one, but if, if you can't enter in it correctly and it doesn't, it rejects it for you, don't worry about the class code, just put in the certification. Uh, <clears throat> make sure you get it for free with your umd.edu email address and then uh, make sure you get certified. Uh, looks like somebody had their hand raised. Is it Rhea? Yeah. Go ahead. Um, can you clarify if the certification can be done in multiple sittings or does it have to be, do all modules have to be completed in one sitting? No, it, it's kind of, it remembers where you are. So if you want to, you know, start it, stop it, go back to it. Yeah, you can do that in multiple sittings. Uh, okay, thank but, you. But the one thing that you can't do <laughs> is when you start answering the questions that they give you, you answer that's fire and forget. Like you answer the question, you can't go back and answer the questions again. So just be careful with their multiple choice questions uh, because back to the getting 70%, um, you really kind of get one shot at it per email address. So therefore, don't really go, you know, zipping through the modules, clicking a bunch of questions, and then say, oh, I'll come back to it later, because then they won't let you get back to that part again. All right. But if you're just pause where you're in the module, come back to, there shouldn't be any problems. All right. <clears throat> so as I said, today, I want to pick up where we left off in the lecture note. So I'm going to go back to uh, lecture note one and go ahead and share my screen. Let me attempt to. So where we kind of left off on Monday is we were talking about the four cornerstones of value creation. And 
<clears throat> that is based on what we're going to be talking to this semester is something called the key value drivers, right? And this slide is just a, a graphical representation of the math that's behind what McKinsey calls their key value driver or KVD formula. It's basically the growing perpetuity formula rearranged. But, and we're going to talk about this in more detail in a minute with Excel. But the idea is <clears throat> that at a very high level, three things drive value, all right? The first one is spread, ROIC and WAC, or IRR and R, if you go back to NPV. Second is growth. And what's key to growth is growth doesn't actually create value. <clears throat> and, and we'll show that as well. Because if you grow a negative spread, you just destroy value at a faster rate. So one of the things that we're going to learn is that growth is an accelerant to value. It's like stepping on the gas. And then the third element is sustainability. And, and what we mean by that is, um, and the book talks about this in the readings this week, but ROIC um, tends to regress towards the mean over time. Growth tends to regress to the mean over time. Nobody maintains high growth forever. Nobody maintains high returns forever. The markets are gonna mature. You know, There's gonna be disruption. Consumer preferences are gonna change, whatever it is. So the question is not for a valuable company, take a, a Microsoft or a, you know an Alphabet or an Apple or any tech company today, it's not that not creating value today, it's how long, right? How long before their growth slows? How long before their return gets back to a more normal level? So that's the sustainability element and that's where we get into competitive advantage. Now, <clears throat> the other element is we drive ROIC. There's gonna be two drivers mathematically of ROIC, margin, which is how much, times productivity or efficiency, which is how often. And so ultimately what it says is there's five things that really matter that are the most important levers of cash flow and value for a business. They're your margin, they're your efficiency, they're your risk, which is cost of capital, your ability to grow, and the sustainability, the competitive advantage of the firm. And those are just summary highlights of what we're gonna be discussing throughout the semester. <clears throat> I also mentioned this on Monday as well, and, and I call these Buffett rules, but we're gonna have some, and we'll talk more about this in the EIC module coming up, but we're gonna have some very specific rules about what makes an attractive industry. And I highlighted this in Bloomberg in our last course, our last class. And the idea is that an attractive industry is an industry where you can maintain a positive spread, All right? So we are gonna define industry attractiveness as a positive spread, all right, over time, all right? And then we're gonna also define competitive advantage as outperforming peers. So it's relative performance to your peers. If you have competitive advantage, then you should basically have a higher spread relative to your peers. That's our definition of competitive advantage, right? And so Warren Buffett, who runs Berkshire Hathaway, has made a lot of money historically, basically investing following these two principles. And, and if you really distill down what he says, he says, look, I, I do two things. I don't invest in companies. All right. He actually says that I don't invest in companies. All right. I invest in industries because they're more important. And that was one of the insights hopefully you got out of the Monday session is that about half your performance is the industry. So therefore, if you invest in a bad industry, it's kind of hard to make money. So it's really not a good place to put your money, no matter how good the companies are. Whereas if you invest in a great industry, you can have a bunch of average companies still doing relatively well. So industry matters. So he starts with an industry. And then he says, I'm going to invest and own a company forever. And what he doesn't mean truly forever, and the guy's about 90 years old, what he, what he basically says when he says forever is he wants something that's enduring. I want something that's going to be a, an attractive industry over a longer period of time. I don't want an industry that's about to fall off a cliff. All right, or I don't want an industry that's going to be horrible for a long period of time. I want an attractive industry that's going to be good over time. Then pick the winners in the industry. Find a good industry. Find companies are going to win that industry. That's his investment philosophy. Okay, And so in a sense, we're going to be kind of looking at the evaluation of companies through those two lenses. So the first lens is, what is the industry? And, and how attractive is that industry? And then the second lens is going to be how good is this company, particularly relative to peers, because you should be outperforming your peers 
if you are going to actually win in that industry, therefore you must have some form of competitive advantage, which can be fleeting. So there's gonna be a time element to it, but you gotta have at least something. So that's gonna be the perspective that we are going to take throughout the semester as we analyze companies. So continuing on, <clears throat> there's some definitional stuff though that I, I think is important relative to the key value drivers that I want us to understand, All right? And so this is gonna introduce a couple of those concepts. So the first thing is the book is gonna talk about something called NOPLAT, N-O-P-L-A-T, uh, or the rest of the world calls it NOPAT, uh, net operating profit, less adjusted taxes, net operating profit after tax. It's basically the operating profit of a firm, all right, proxy EBIT, all right, basically after tax, as if the company were debt free, okay? So let's say that we start with this generic firm that makes $100 million of no pad or no plat from operations, right? And this firm takes $50 million and it reinvests it to sustain and grow the business. And it takes another $50 million and it returns it to the investors, pays it out as dividends, stock buyback, whatever. So that creates two important ratios that we're gonna be using this semester called the reinvestment rate and the payout rate, okay? Reinvestment rate is the amount of the profits that are reinvested, 50 divided by 100 is 50%. Payout is the amount of profits that are paid out, 50 divided by 100 is 50%. So this company is just a 50-50 reinvestment payout ratio. Half is reinvested, half is paid out. This is kind of arbitrary in this simple example. But the, the point I want to make here of the story is <clears throat> that one minus the reinvestment rate is the payout rate, and one minus the payout rate is the reinvestor rate. So if you're not reinvesting, you're paying out, okay? If you're not paying out, you're reinvesting. Those are the two things that you can do with your profit. Those are the only two things. Now we can confuse this in the real world because we're like, well, we can buy back stock, we can pay off debt, we can make an interest payment. There's multiple ways to pay out, but it's all payout, okay? We can reinvest in inventory, we can reinvest in working capital, we can reinvest in facilities, we can buy IT systems. Yes, it's just reinvestment. So at a high level, it's reinvestment or it's payout. And again, those two ratios have to add up to 100% of your profits, okay, just definitionally. So with that in mind, I wanna define two more things. I wanna define growth, which is known as sustainable growth or little g in our formulas. And I wanna define something called free cash flow, okay? So just another assumption. So this previous company, which makes $50 million, let's just say it makes a 10% ROI. It makes a 10% ROI historically, it's gonna make a 10% prospectively, just to keep the math simple. It's gonna keep making 10%. So if this company, company A, is reinvesting $50 million at 10%, it's going to have $5 million of new profits on the 50 million. And if it keeps making 10% of its current business, it's going to keep making 100 million. So between year one and year two, profits are going to go from 100 million to 105 million. And it's just kind of mathematically how this would work. So what I want to do though, is I want to shortcut that formula. And the formula for growth in profits or G is the investment rate of 50% times the ROIC, the return of the new investment of 10%. So if I invest 50% of my profits, I make 10% on that, I can grow my business with internal funds sustainably at 5% a year, okay? So that's just the, the simple mathematical expression of G. So we talk about sustainable growth. There's two drivers of growth. What is our ability to grow with internal funds, right? Number one is it's the ROI. And number two, it's the reinvestment rate, okay? So in this case, the company is growing at 5%. Second definition that I wanna give on this slide is free cash flow. A company is not worth the sum of its future profits. Say that again, a company's not worth the sum of its future profits because it's gonna take some of those profits and it's gonna put them back into the business. So 
the value of the company is the profit after the reinvestment, right? I like to think about it on a personal level. Say you buy a car, you want to keep the car for 10 years. You got to eventually do maintenance on the car, the car is going to fall apart. Well, that's reinvestment. It's no different. So I got to put some money back into the car beyond the car payment or the car is going to fall apart. Well, the same is true for a company. If you don't reinvest, your company's buildings are going to fall apart. Your equipment's going to get old. Your laptops are going to die. You got to reinvest. And then if you want to grow, you got to take some of the profits and put them back in to grow, growth capital. So that's the point. What you're worth is profit after reinvestment. And there's not an accounting term for that. So in finance, we created our own term for that and we call it free cash flow. So free cash flow, which is defined as profit after reinvestment. In this example, it's 100 million of profit, 50 million of reinvestment, 50 million of free cash flow. That is the theoretical value of the business because the free cash flow is also the theoretical payout rate. Right. And so eventually there's two things I can do with the free cash flow. I can either put it in the bank and just grow my savings account, which I could eventually pay out to investors, or I could pay it out to them immediately. But that's the point. That is the cash. And when we say free, it, it doesn't mean it doesn't cost anything. What it means, it's free and clear to be paid out and it's not tied up or committed in the business. So a company is worth the sum of its future free cash flows from an operating value and free cash flow is the theoretical payout rate long-term for a capital, right? So just very important definitional stuff as we get started. Questions about any of that? Okay, great. So the easy part is the concept of free cash flow. The hard part is the math because the accountants don't make it easy on us. So a lot of what we're gonna be doing in the next few weeks is learn how to formally create free cash flow from accounting statements. And if you don't know how to do it, you're gonna hate it, but it's important. And that is something that you're gonna learn how to do from this in this class. Now, how does this tie into value? How do we value a company? Well, very simplistically, if we take this company and we put in a peer. So we'll just call them company A, company B. They're made up companies. So these two companies both have $100 million per year of net income, profit. Actually, in this case, we'll call it no pat, right? They both have the same level of risk. So we'll just say they have a whack or cost of capital of 10%. So same cash profit, same whack. These companies are both growing their profits at 5% per year. So the same G's, sustainable growths, 100, 105, 110, dot, 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 et cetera. Okay. Looking at the data on this slide, tell me which company is more valuable, A or B and why? Would it be company B because the sum of their cash flows is higher than company A? It would actually be correct. But why? Why is company B generating more cash flow for the same profit? It has a greater return on investment. I'm sorry, what'd you say again? It has a greater return on investment. Which one, company B? Yeah. Okay, and how does that translate into more cash flow? You're right, if that was Muhammad, you're right. But how does that translate into more cash flow? That's the important insight I want you guys to have. Why does B generate more free cash flow for the same profit than A? Since company B's investment rate is half of A's, it's like not putting as much money back in. So um, it's free cash flow, like keeps the money that it doesn't put back in. So it's not. So they're putting in, B is putting in half the reinvestment of A, right? Without cutting corners, why can B do that? How can B put in half the investment of A? Kevin, so your hand up. Yeah, I was gonna say just because um, 
their their return on invest net investment so high that over you know years it'll just compound to the point where they basically have a similar amount uh of investment money opposed to investment rate with a much higher return on that investment? Yeah, you and Muhammad are both right. So that's the idea is that because B is better at what they do, they only have to invest half as much to have the same profits. And because they only ha invest half as much, those profits generate more free cash flow. So that was the link. Muhammad intuitively had that right when he said, more ROI equals more free cash flow because that's actually the, the insight I want you guys to have is that ROI, ROIC in particular, is a proxy for free cash flow. And all things being equal, if you have a higher return in investment, you will generate more free cash flow, caveat, at the same level of growth. All right, what makes it tricky in the real world is when the growth rates are different. When I grow the cash flows at a different rate. But if you grow at the same rate, you have more ROI, by definition, you have to have more free cash flow. Because look at what's happening at company B. They either put at a 20% return versus a 10% return, they put in half of what A does at 20%. And therefore, they, they're going to generate more cash per dollar of investment. Or if B invested 50, same as A, then at 20% return, they'd have more profit. Their profit would be 110, not 105 and they'd still have more free cash flow. Either way, B is going to win that race. So as simple as this example is, what, what it really illustrates, and this is a really key fundamental issue I want you to understand about this class, is that McKinsey's approach to valuation, which is why I kind of like it, it's kind of elegant, is it's all based on free cash flow. It's just ROIC is a proxy for free cash flow. So McKinsey's the ROIC company because it's a lot easier to forecast and manage ROIC than it is to create free cash flows. And it's just rearrange math, right? But the insights are the same, which is more ROIC at the same level of growth, more free cash flow. Okay. Questions about that? Make sense? All right, so then how does this Translate the value. Well, the difference, you can see this in the next slide, between a project and a company is that projects come to an end and companies last forever. At least that's the theory, is that companies are gonna be around forever. Now, none of us are gonna know the answer to that question because none of us are gonna live forever. But <clears throat> the point of the story is we assume companies last forever. So therefore we got to value them as if they last a very long time. Well, to do that, we use something called a perpetuity, specifically a growing perpetuity. And the bottom of the slide represents the formula for a growing perpetuity. And it's three parts to it. It's tell me what your cash flow is. And cash flow in this case is free cash flow. And we divide it by the cost of capital. And in this case, the cost of capital and the free cash flow is the WAC, and then minus the G. Okay, so cash flow divided by R minus G is perpetuity. Cash flow is free cash flow. R is WAC. G is growth in that free cash flow. So that is what's called <clears throat> the key value drivers formula, or basically the proxy for a company for its long term cash flow. This is how we represent a company long term. All right, dividend growth formula. Gordon dividend growth is based on this, just using equity cash flows. But the whole point of the perpetuity is the perpetuity actually formula has one major problem, it's probably a couple of problems, but it's one major problem. And, and the problem is this, when you use a growing perpetuity, the assumption is that the incremental return on the future cash flows equals the incremental return on the historical cash flows. Translation, whatever return and investment you make now, you make forever just perpetuates it into the future. So the problem in the real world when you use a growing perpetuity is if you apply it to a company that's in a high growth trajectory, then basically it's gonna stay in that high growth trajectory forever in a perpetuity and you're gonna overvalue the firm. If you apply the growing perpetuity to a company that's performing poorly, then it's gonna be poor forever and it's never gonna improve. So the one challenge with this formula that we use in the real world, 
and is taught in all the academic classes is that it kind of exaggerates the current direction of the firm. And we're always looking for ways to try and improve upon that. So this is the way McKinsey has attempted to improve on that problem. What they've done is they've taken the growing perpetuity equation and they've rearranged it. And this is how they've rearranged it. Cash flow is free cash flow. So that is profit times one minus the reinvested rate. We just define that. Sustainable growth is the investment rate times the ROIC. Therefore, investment rate is growth over ROIC. So if we make those two substitutions, the formula on the left gets rearranged to be the formula on the right. So the formula on the right is a growing perpetuity equation. It's the same formula, but here's the difference. It's got four values in it instead of three. And what's different is instead of forecasting free cash flow, we forecast profit and ROIC. And specifically, what that ROIC in the key value driver equation, which is what this is called, represents is incremental ROIC. It's not the historical ROIC, it's the prospective ROIC. What is the ROIC in the future gonna be? That's what that number is. And what it allows us to do is to have a different ROIC in the future than we have had in the past, right? Now, I'm not saying it's a perfect formula because we're still using this simple formula to represent the entire future of the firm, right? Which is probably 70 to 90% of the value for most companies broken down these four numbers. But if nothing else, I can at least represent a more realistic future with the ROIC if it's different than the past. And that is the advantage of the key value driver equation, okay? Questions about the formula, how it's rearranged, any insights that we just talked about? Okay. Then in Elms, in the files folder, there is a file and there's a folder and share this, it's easy to see. It's here. There is a folder under files called KVD Sim. Put up a file there this morning, right? And it's the Excel file key value driver exercise .xlsx. That is the file that I'm about to open. I'm gonna look at that in Excel. So. Just make sure I share this. Why it's not sharing. There's my Excel, there's Excel. Okay, so what I've done in this key value driver simulation file, shrink a little bit, is I have the four elements of the key value driver formula. So that is the formula on slide 10 of the PowerPoint, okay? And it basically has the, the four elements. It's got the profit, it's got the G, it's got the ROIC, and it's got the WAC, right? And then this cell, B7, <clears throat> is the key value driver equation, right? So since you don't have to type it in, I've typed it in for you with the correct order of operations. So here's the idea. When I asked earlier <clears throat> and I said, think about company A and B, and I said, which of those two companies was more valuable? Intuitively, you guys said B. But what I'm doing here is I'm just putting the data into the key value driver formula and I'm telling you the answer is B mathematically as well. B is worth 50% more than A. B would be worth a billion five. A would be worth a billion based on the data that was in the PowerPoint slide for companies A and B. Because at the same level of profit, 100 million a year, at the same growth rate, 5%, 10%, 20% ROIC, 10% cost capital, with the formula, company A is worth a billion. With the formula, company B is worth a billion five, okay? And then we have something called a multiple, a price to earnings multiple. 
And the way we calculate the price to earnings multiple is we take the value of the company, the price, and we divide it by the profit of the company, the earnings. So a billion divided by 100 says that company A would trade at a multiple of 10 times earnings, <clears throat> and company B would trade at a multiple of 15 times earnings. So this actually highlights something that I mentioned as well in the introduction on Monday, which is that multiples are just rearranged math, right? And so what I mean by that is that by definition, they have to give you the same answer. There's only one value of a firm and we're all trying to value the same values, which is coming at different approaches. And that's the idea of multiples. It's got to give us the same answer as a DCF. So multiples are just the shortcut for DCF. But in any event, B not only would trade at a higher value, B would trade at a higher multiple. Questions about anything that I just said? Uh, Raya? Ria. Ria, sorry. It's okay. Um, so does does it always mean that like a higher multiple means the company has high, has a higher value or can it be overvalued too? <clears throat> uh, well, because these numbers are based on expectations, which we're gonna talk about in a minute, uh, if your expectations are unrealistic, then absolutely it could be overvalued, okay? So, but if, if the, the numbers come out right, then you're properly valued. You're just worth more. B is worth more because, and if you look at the data here, I'm paying more for B because B is a better company. B is generating more return. Therefore, they're generating more cash. Therefore, I pay more for more cash. And so B is properly valued with the formula if they were to trade at 15 times earnings. If for some reason, like GameStop, suddenly company B were trading at 50 times earnings for crazy reasons that are beyond explanation, and this was their data, then eventually they should trade at 15. There's arbitrage that will come in there. And you know that's what I think GameStop, I would just call simply right now Ponzi scheme. <laughs> if you've been following the most recent data associated with that, because the cash flows are not representing the value of that company. <clears throat> and the reasonable expectation of the change is, is not there on any you know common sense time horizon. So it's just a question of when it comes back to normal. And, and normal means a value that is more realistic of the expected cash flows. But that's an assessment. I could be wrong. There's, I could technically be wrong. And GameStop could suddenly create all those cash flows. But no, nobody on the street seems to be thinking that. But let's go back to A and B. <clears throat> so this key value driver equation gives you four critical insights, which we're about to go through to value. So I want to do a little bit of, of what ifs. Right? And these are the important lesson learned, to be honest with you, that will help you understand what we're about to do this semester. So let's say company A doubles its profits overnight. Instead of 100 million a year, makes 200 million a year. When I hit enter, what's gonna happen to the value of the company? What's gonna happen to their multiple? When they go from profits of 100 million a year to 200 million overnight, what's gonna happen? What happens to B7? What happens to B9, sell B9? Their value is going to double, but the multiple is going to stay the same because the profit and value doubled. All right, let's see if she's right. Double, triple, quadruple. Do this with column B, with company B. Double, Notice that as the profit changes for both companies, the value is going up and the multiple is not changing. In finance, we call this sizing. It's bigger. You become more valuable because you generate more absolute amount of cash flow. That's one way to become more valuable. You just become bigger, right? But you're not better. Your multiple is not changing. I'm not paying more for those earnings. You just have more earnings. Okay, so that's one way to increase value. So how do I become better? How do I get people to pay more for the same amount of earnings, get more free cash flow out of those earnings? Well, this is where the key value drivers come in. 
the key value drivers are these three items, the growth and spread, the growth, the return, and the risk. Growth, ROIC, cost of capital. <clears throat> so as I look at the key value drivers, what changes there that will change the multiple? So let's say that company A decides to go global or a US company that goes global. And now because they're global, they can grow their profits faster. They're gonna grow at 6% a year versus 5% a year. But they're going global with the same low cost business model. So the ROIC is not gonna change. The cost of capital is not gonna change, but they are gonna grow their profits 1% faster per year. So instead of 100, 105, 110, it becomes 100, 106, 112, right? End of perpetuity, dot, dot, dot. So the question is, if A grows at 6% per year forever, now what happens to their value and their multiple? What should happen? What do you think? What do you guys think? When I hit enter, what's going to happen? What's going to happen to the value? What's going to happen to the multiple? Is the value going to go up? They're not going to change. Why not? Because when you increase it, they end up dividing out in the, I think. All right. So she's right. Is it Lauren? Lauren, you're right. Seven, eight, nine percent. I keep changing the percent. Nothing's changing. Just make sure I didn't make a mathematical error in my formulas. So six. Oh, that one changed. Seven. That one changed again. So B is changing, but A is not. Why? Is it because A's ROIC and cost of capital is the same? Exactly. I like to say that A is on the treadmill. You run really fast, you don't go anywhere, and eventually you get tired. Because A is borrowing at 10%, A makes 10%, they cancel each other out, the 10 pays off the 10 in interest, there's no principal left. There's no change in principle. So therefore, zero NPV. A is just a bunch of more zero NPV projects. B is borrowing at 10, making 20. So the more projects they do, the more valuable they become. It becomes exponential. And this is why I say that growth doesn't create value in and of itself because there really is bad growth and good growth. A is bad growth. I'm throwing a lot of resources to basically not go anywhere. Right? I'm kind of stuck in the mud where A may not be going anywhere, but B is. The more B grows, the more valuable they become because it's the return on the growth, the growth return combination that matters. And so A is growing a zero spread, B is growing a positive spread. So when you can grow a positive spread, you become more valuable. And that differentiates growth. Questions? Does that make sense? So I'm gonna go to the real world for a second. All right, so this is Bloomberg again. And I am gonna to go to Merck, who we were talking about on Monday with the disappointing news that their vaccine did not work for COVID-19. But one of the other features of Bloomberg is under FA, this is historical financial analysis, which means all the historical income statements, balance sheet, cash flow statements, this is all their historical data. It's for any company. 
Okay. And again, separated by tab, historical income savings, balance sheets, et cetera. Summary here, and I can get the detail later. But what I'm going to do is again, just like I did in the RV section, I'm going to go here to custom so I can look up any historical data point that I want. I'm going to create a custom <clears throat> series of data. So what custom enter field do I want to look at historically for Merck? So what I want to look at is ROIC. Return on invested capital year by year. And then I want to look at WAC. And then I want to look at growth. All right. So we see shrank a little, shrank a little, close to zero growth. And then they just started growing recently. But I want you to look at 2014 through 2019. I want you to think about the key value driver equation. And I want you to tell me what their stock price line looks like if we were to draw a line chart from 2014 to 2019. What would their stock price look like? Would it be flat? Would it be down? Would it be up? How would it look? How would, how would the curve look? Is that like a V? Is it like a what? Like a like letter V. Letter V? Yes. Okay. So why do you think it's like a V? Because uh, uh, 17 is the lowest. Okay, so let's start with the spread. Look at their spread. Not a good spread, not a good spread, not a good spread, not a good spread. Spread gets much better. So at least this part should be lower than that part, right? If I draw the line, especially because now they're growing the positive spread. Well, let's look. GP. And I'm going to go back to 2000. 13 to today. So that's the chart. That's the, the area that they were in. Got a little worse, stayed kind of low, stayed pretty flat when the zero spread. Then the spread started getting positive and they started growing it. The stock price started rocketing up. See, it's not that hard. This should not be a surprise for a big mature company like Merck. This is how they should be priced because when they're not growing and they don't have much of a spread, they're going to be choppy with their stock price. When they're growing the positive spread, the, the stock price is going to go up because they're more valuable. The more cash that's being generated there, it's positive cash flow. So that's what I'm saying. Like when, when you start to apply this, you start thinking about how stocks should behave. I'm not saying they always do because it is dealing with what the future is and is it expected to continue in the future. But the point of the story is it has a lot to do with how companies will behave. And those are two important lessons. So the first lesson is growth at zero spread. I call it the treadmill, which are those are the companies that are growing really fast, but they're not going anywhere. Number two is the growth at a high spread, high spread, high growth companies. You know what they look like? They look like Facebook. What has their share price been doing for five years? It's been a pretty much up, up looking trend. Why? Because they're growing a high spread. <clears throat> All right, and people are gonna pay more for that. So do stock prices have a lot to do with the spread and how wide it is? So if it has the bigger spread, that's when you see um, the price of the stock go up? Well, it depends. You can have a giant spread and no growth and your stock price might not, might not do much because then you start trading like a bond. Mm -hmm. So it's the difference of, or a balance of good growth with also a positive spread? Yeah, because watch this. I'm going to put this growth down to zero. And then watch when the ROIC goes up to 30% and 40% and 50% in the key. Oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, 
seeing what I'm changing here in Excel. Let me switch back to Excel. Keep forgetting that I'm not in a classroom. <laughs> so where is Excel? Here we go. So as I change my ROIC from 20 to 30 with zero growth, maybe growth zero instead of five to 40, doesn't matter what your spread is if you're not growing. Now, if the spread starts to become big and then you grow, then suddenly it becomes the more you grow that big spread, the more valuable you become. But it's that's what I said, you need growth of a big spread. If you just have a big spread and you don't grow, you look like Apple. And Apple actually does not have a gigantic PE. And the reason why Apple doesn't have a gigantic PE is because as a $240 billion company, they're growing at like two to 3% a year. So the problem is law of large numbers. That's actually one of the things the book talks about. One of the reasons why growth slows down for big companies is because of the law of large number effect, right? Because think about this, for Apple to grow 10%, they need to grow $25 billion in one year of new sales. That's not easy. They have to grow the equivalent of a Fortune 500 company every year from scratch, right? When you get to be that big, that's harder and harder to do, right? So that's one of the reasons why growth starts to slow for more bigger companies, just law of large numbers. But that's the point. Your multiple will come down as your growth slows, which is actually point number three. So if I'm back to the key value driver equation, scenario number three, which is the other one I wanna show you, is this one. When you have a high growth rate, let's say it's 7%, and you become more mature or law of large number effects smaller, watch what happens when the growth goes from seven to six to five to four, two, three, right? And, and so what I'm saying here is that <clears throat> the multiple scenario three, this is the expectation cornerstone. And what it tells me is that if I thought that you're gonna make, and I'll put the numbers back to where they originally were, 20% per year, and you grow 20 cents at 5% per year, you're making 20 cents per dollar and you grow it at 5% per year. And I realized I was too optimistic and you're going to make 20 cents per dollar, but you're only going to grow it at 3 cents, 3% 3 per year. You're going to be worth less. And so that's the repricing that I would have to do. I overestimated what I thought you were going to do in the future. Therefore I have to reprice you lower. Okay. And that's that implicit in the person that asked me the question about a high multiple company. Right, because what it basically says with a high multiple company is what justifies a high multiple is generating a lot of cash flow and growing it really fast. That's what I expect of a high multiple company. But eventually that high multiple company is not gonna generate that cash at the same rate. Therefore their multiple will start to come down. It has to, or I am too optimistic about how high that company is gonna fly. It's not gonna fly as high as I thought. It's not gonna grow as fast. And then I had to reprice it as it, as it comes down. One of those two things is gonna happen. It's natural for any company. So a low PE is not bad. And that's what we got to get out of your mind. It's not a question of good or bad. It's just different, right? A low PE company means it's a company that has a lower growth spread combination. A higher PE company has a higher growth spread combination. As the company with a higher growth spread combination leaves to grow slow, their PE is going to come down. And that's why one of the most, you know, uninformed comments that people can make is the way that they're taught how to do multiple analysis. Because what you'll hear is they'll say, oh, well, Facebook's multiple is X, Apple's is Y, you should buy Apple because they're cheap. No, that's wrong. The reason why Apple's not, it's not on sale is because Facebook's growth rate is so much higher than Apple's. Therefore, they're going to pay a premium and it's going to be a higher multiple. You could actually play it out in the key value driver equation. And as Facebook's growth slows as they get bigger, then their PE is going to look more like Apple's, not the other way around. Okay, that's scenario three. Scenario four. I have a negative spread. Right? I'm destroying value. I'm borrowing at 10, I make eight. What happens when I grow that faster? Well, keep borrowing a 10, keep making eight, do more of that. You get worse and worse and worse. 
Hey doctor, my head hurts. Why does your head hurt? Well, I've been banging against the wall. Well, prescription, stop banging against the wall, right? So for the companies with negative spread, what's the prescription? Stop growing. Don't do the bad growth. Instead of growing at 7% with a negative spread, grow at 3%. Magically, you destroy less value. Grow at zero. Shrink. Get rid of that negative growth. Right? And this is growth into perpetuity. I'm not saying that every time a company has a dip that you should just sell because it could be for short-term reasons. But we're talking about long-term growth being negative. Long-term growth issues. Because this G is growth into perpetuity that we're talking about. It's not growth in three months. It's not one quarter growth. But regardless, key value drivers. And these four scenarios should inform you in everything we do this semester, including your business uh, simulation that you're gonna be doing when you pick companies, because you can start looking at headlines. You can say, okay, incrementally, what does it mean to growth? What does it mean to return? What does it mean to risk? And if I could think about directionally, which way it's going, I should have a pretty good idea long-term of what should happen to the company stock price. Questions? Comments? Does it make sense? All right. <clears throat> so I'm going to do something that is a little bit more advanced. And we're not going to be here for about two months. So we're going to come back to this. But I'll give you an example of how this will play out when we do real world multiples. All right. So we'll think about this as, as a price to earnings multiple. So we're going to use Costco. Well, I heard of Costco before. And what I'm going to do with the key value driver sim is I'm going to make a couple of substitutions. And so in the formula, expected profit is actually no plat if you're going to do it based on free cash flow. But if you're going to do it on a real price to earnings multiple, then price per share is based on earnings per share, which is based on net income. Then the expected profit in this formula could be replaced and substituted with expected net income. The expected long-term growth is the growth in the net income, not the growth in the free cash flow. The expected ROIC becomes the expected ROE. Expected ROE. And the cost of capital becomes the cost of equity. Because if I'm dis discounting equity cash flow. I want to discount it with the cost of equity, not the WAC. Okay, so I can use the exact same key value driver formula. I'm just using equity values rather than free cash flow values. Okay. Why Why are you doing that again? Because I'm going to do a real PE. This is actually real PE. So instead of multiple, this is literally the price to earnings multiple. And the value becomes the market cap. That would be the, the market cap of the company. That's pure PE. If I use PE values, equity cash flows, I'm just going to value the equity cash flows. We're going to have a Costco today. So again, it'd probably be easier if I share my desktop. So I'm going to try and do that. So I can keep jumping back and forth. Share desktop. Okay. I think I can. All right. So I'll do not share my desktop. Share desktop. There it goes. All right. <clears throat> So let's go in Bloomberg and I'm gonna look up Costco. Hopefully you can see my desktop. So this is Costco. So what I'm gonna care about is, this is Costco today. I'm gonna to go to the EEO, which is the earnings estimate overview. Now you'll notice on this screen, this is the forward earnings for Costco, not the historical earnings. Because when we do multiples, we care about the future. 
right? What is what are you worth in the future? That's valuation. So I care much more about next year cash flow rather than last year's cash flow when I value you. So Bloomberg gives me an insight as to realistically what is next year for Costco. So you can actually count columns in Bloomberg. This is last year's actual data for Costco. This is this year. This is next year. Forward year one, forward year two, forward year three, forward year four. Now Costco is kind of in the middle of 2021. They're 2021 because it actually ends in August. So we're in January, at the end of January. So really we got, you know, September through December is kind of already passed for them. And so we have a, a mixture of past and future data in this year. So what we will do in this class is we actually wanna look at this year as the first clean full forecast year where it's 12 month of forecast. That's where you get more normalized data. Okay, so that's gonna be what's gonna matter for our multiple. So right now, the net income for 2000, fiscal 2022 that the Wall Street's expecting for Costco is 4,879,000,000. So I'm gonna come back to my key value driver formula. I'm gonna put in 48,79. Okay, second, I need to know what the expected ROE is. Well, believe it or not, if I can scroll down or minimize the screen, that is the future forecasted ROE for Costco that Wall Street analysts are doing. So 25%, 25%, 24%, 24%. So somewhere around 24, 25%, I'll be conservative and I'll use 24% as the expected ROE for Costco, just in the ballpark, right? Now I need a cost of equity for Costco. And if I go to the WAC screen in Bloomberg, the cost of capital is 6.1% but the cost of equity today is 6.4%. So their, their cost of equity today is 6.4%, according to Bloomberg. So here's the point. Using our key value driver formula, with no growth, they'd be worth $76 billion and they'd have a, a PE of 15.6. Now, right now, based on the $360 share price of Costco, $360 divided by 2022 earnings of $10.90 is a PE in 2022 of 33, 33.07. That is their forward PE. They're trading at 33 times earnings. So observed, 33.07. Okay. Academic formula says 15.6. So how fast is the market expecting Costco to grow? How about 4% a year? Ooh, getting close. According to our academic formula, these two should match. So right now, it's probably going to be like 3.9, I don't know, 3.8. Somewhere in the middle, 3 point, oh, there we go. Oh, 3.85, getting close, 3.88. Somewhere in there. And by the way, that would, at this key value driver formula, that would give you a PE of 33, which is what they're trading at. And it would say they'd be worth $161 billion in change in market cap. Costco today, share price times shares outstanding. You have the DES screen. It's called market cap. 159,645. 161 with some rounding based on some rough guesses. That's Costco share price. This is Costco share price right here. So what's gonna drive Costco share price, higher or lower? Well, what's gonna drive it is what if they can grow and instead of 4%, what if they grow at 5%? One more percent growth would almost double their share price. That's perpetuity. Now for a company that big, that's gonna be hard to do. 
versus if they got their ROE to 30%, barely budges. Now, what really could hurt Costco is if interest rates go up and cost of equity starts to rise. So if risk premium goes higher, instead of 6.4%, it goes to 7.4%, watch out. Costco stock price is gonna go down 40%. See, this is key value drivers. These are insights we're gonna get a little bit later in the semester. This will call multiple analysis. But the, the idea is the, the multiple stock prices are, are based on cash flows and they're based on these equations. If for no other reason, then like roommates at Wharton are now working on Wall Street doing this shit. So that's the point. Like, this is what they use. This is what you're taught. This is what you, you're taught here in Maryland. You're gonna go work at, in companies. You're gonna learn how to do this. So this is, what matters? Excuse my language. Questions? All right, last one I'll show you. Look at this. Why is, let's just look at Facebook as an example, with the EEO, just because it's easy to see. Look at Facebook multiple. Based on last year, 32 times earnings. Next year, 20 times earnings. Year after that, 26 times earnings. Year after that, 21 times earnings. This is the price to earnings multiple. It keeps going down, right? As their revenue goes up, why? You click on the growth tab. What's the growth rate? 24, 19, 17. As Facebook's growth comes down, their multiple comes down. So they're not going to trade at 23 times earnings in three years. They're just not because they're not growing 26% a year like they were last year. They're going to be growing 17% a year. Now, don't get me wrong, 17% at a bigger size is still pretty impressive. But the multiples has to be lower when you do the math. And that's what you actually see here. So this is, this is the mistake that people make is what they'll do is they'll use like a, a trailing 12 month multiple, which is kind of this. And they'll say, oh, well, Facebook's trailing 12 month multiple is 32. So a dollar of EPS means $32 a share price. Well, yeah, based on last year, but in three years, a dollar of EPS is only gonna be worth $21 a share price because the growth rate of the bigger number, notice how much bigger, when you grow on $147 billion, it's harder to get the same growth rate than when you're $70 billion, right? When you're twice the size, it's hard to grow with the same percentage. That's the law of large number effect. Therefore, Facebook's PE would come down. And what I'm telling you is that Facebook, which has a PE in the 20s, is probably gonna have a, a higher PE than other companies that aren't growing as fast mainly because they're not growing as fast. And so that's what we have to start to understand when we look at the marketplace. So my guess is, I haven't looked at the data, but we're talking about, somebody mentioned Apple, when we talked about industries. This, <clears throat> right now, this is not normal. <laughs> that PE for Apple, who's seeing its growth rate this small is not normal. But everybody loves Apple. And don't get me wrong, I got their iPhones, I'm talking to you on a Mac, I'm, I'm contributing to this Apple ecosystem. But when you become a $300 billion company, so this year there are three, 274, I was actually missed their size earlier, 319 this year, 330, it's impressive, very profitable. But with this level of growth, you don't usually see these PEs. So Apple right now is a safety stock and everybody's has been flocking to them, but Apple might be a little overvalued. 
But again, we'll get into that later this semester. In fact, that might be a really good homework assignment to get into just about whether Apple really is overvalued, but that's for another day. Questions about any of this? All right, last but not least, homework assignment, or forget for Monday, it's your first homework assignment. It's a couple of people have already done it. So homework one. So using Bloomberg and what we've been talking about, this is a real simple homework assignment. You need to find an industry that has a negative spread. And you need to take a screenshot of it and you gotta submit the screenshot, right? And the key to this class is you can't share other people's screenshots. You gotta do them yourself. Okay, and so when you take a screenshot, it will will know if you turned in somebody else's screenshot. Don't turn somebody else's screenshot. That'd be an honor code violation. Bad for you. Bad for me. Bad for everybody. So it's not that hard. Do your own screenshots. This exercise should take you all of five minutes. But it's really just to make sure that you've gotten your terminal license and started to use Bloomberg. So here's the point: go to a company, type RV, find an industry that has a negative spread. We talked about this on Monday with under custom and the spread template that we used. Now this is not an industry with negative spread. So you need to have one that has the ROIC less than the WAC. Okay, find an industry. When you do, this is how you take a screenshot. In the upper right-hand corner of Bloomberg, you see this little icon. This is the export icon. Click, take screenshot, save the screenshot. You'll save it as a GIF, GIF, whatever you call it, file. Or you can email it to yourself. Okay. Or, but the one thing you do have to remember is that when you do save it, because remember you're on a remote computer, don't save it to the remote computer. You got to save it to your desktop. Because remember, you're actually using Bloomberg not on your own computer. You're using it on a computer in the cloud. So just make sure when you save it, you save it to your desktop, you don't save it to the remote desktop. But in any event, that's how you take a screenshot. Just hit save. It'll ask you where you wanna save it. I'll put it in my downloads folder. I usually would call it ticker-rv. It's just so you know the screen. Save, that's the file you need to upload. There's no, that's the homework. Now this would not be a correct homework assignment. <laughs> just get a zero on the homework assignment because basically you need to find an issue with a negative spread. And I think we actually talked about a couple of those in class on Monday. But that's homework one. Monday, 10 a.m., all sections. Again, pause, questions about any of this? When can we get the recordings, Professor? So uh, apparently when I save, it takes about 20 to 30 minutes to process the video. And then I'm uploading it to YouTube, which generally would be after the next class. So the recording can be available. I think they're automatically now uploaded to Panopto. Uh, so you can find that in about half an hour. And then the file that I put on YouTube will be up later today on my YouTube channel. And I'll post a, a, an announcement that it's there on YouTube. If you wanna look at it on YouTube. Thank you. Okay. So last but not least, um, I'm going to put you in teams, check your teams by Monday, just, just make sure that you know what team that you're on. On Monday, we're going to introduce the Bloomberg trading simulation. So be prepared for that. Turn in homework one by 10 a.m. You have a 15 minute grace period, which means by 1015 is when the link goes away. And at that point, you get a zero, right? Make sure you get your Bloomberg um, license because you won't be able to do this, this without the, the Bloomberg license. As I said, if you haven't, please fill out the form on the website requesting so I can authorize you to complete the process to get your terminal license. And if you haven't started your certification, make sure you start your certification because the Bloomberg certification is due two weeks from Friday. Okay? In advance of the Bloomberg people coming for the advanced training on the 22nd of February. Other than that, stay safe. Have a great weekend. See everybody next week. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.